My name is Christian Parenti. I am from Vermont in the United States. I live in New York City. I teach at the City University of New York and at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is a very interesting school. It was, uh, traditionally, it was a school for where the police got their BAs and their master's degrees. And uh, it was going to be closed during the fiscal crisis of the 1970s, but it was saved by student protests. And the student protests were successful in part because the police were very sympathetic to the students, because a lot of the police had gone to school there. So even though it's the police college, it actually has a kind of very interesting kind of left culture and left pedigree. A lot of former offenders go there. Um, most of our students are from poor and working class neighborhoods, so it's a very interesting place. So that's where I teach. I have written four books. The first one was called Lockdown America, Police and Prisons in the Age of Crisis. And that was a history of the criminal justice buildup in the United States from the late 60s through to the early 2000s. And I explained that through an economic history of the transformation of American capitalism due to the profit crisis of the 1970s and then the arrival of neoliberalism and the need for a new form of regulation um, of, of sort of you know social control. If, if American capitalism wasn't going to maintain stability by uh, welfare payments and some redistribution, treating people well, it had to kind of deal with inequality and so it did that through the war on drugs, through demonizing the poor, through imprisoning an enormous number of people and militarizing its police forces, building up its police forces, increasing surveillance. So that was the, the story of the first book, Lockdown America. The next book was called The Soft Cage, Surveillance in America from Slavery to the War on Terror. And that looked at, not at police investigations, but just the question of routine everyday surveillance. Why is it that we carry ID cards that have photographs on them and a national registry number and, and, and the biometric, which are linked to bi the biometric um, information of at least your fingerprint. Now that's, that's changing. So I traced you know, the, the slow development of routine everyday surveillance through American history. And I've always been an, uh, an academic and a journalist. And uh, for a number of years, almost a decade, I left academia, went full-time into reporting. And I reported from Iraq and Afghanistan quite a bunch. And I wrote, my third book was called The Freedom, Shadows and Hallucinations in Occupied Iraq. And that was a kind of an account of the first year and a half of the US occupation. And then the name comes from the direct translation from Arabic. Um, and, people will talk about the freedom, because in, in Arabic you say al huria which is like uh, the freedom. It sounds strange to the US ear, but people would say, oh, this is the freedom. There's like chaos in Baghdad, everything's being looted and falling apart, and they say, this, this is the freedom? Thank you for the freedom. So it became kind of a, a joke between my translator and I, the freedom. So that's what that book was about. And then my most recent book was called The Soft, Ca uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tropic of Chaos, Climate change and the new geography of violence, and that was that came out of my years of reporting. And I was I was in Afghanistan, and did a series of stories over a number of years about the uh, poppy trade, the heroin trade. So in Afghanistan, the opium poppy is a huge crop, and I would ask farmers, why do you grow this crop that the government can come after you for growing it. They, there's an eradication campaign. And part of the answer, w along with other things, was always that a poppy is very drought resistant. And it's the only crop that we can grow and make money on in these conditions. And at first, I didn't even really hear what they were saying. And then I realized, oh, Afghanistan's going through a really severe drought, which has coincided with the whole NATO occupation there. And they realized, okay, so there's actually kind of a climatological angle to this war. You know, we wouldn't reduce the war in Afghanistan to climate change at all, but that even there, there is an environmental aspect to the war. And I realized that that's probably the case in many other conflicts. And so Tropic of Chaos sort of looks at the way that climate change all over the world in different situations from East Africa to Central Asia to Latin America and into the U.S., how climate change by interacting with the legacy of Cold War militarism and the legacy of neoliberal economic restructuring is 
exacerbating these two pre-existing crises and frequently causing these to, to blossom into outright violence. Climate change comes into these situations in the form of extreme weather, floods, droughts, etc., and the state has been reduced to a shadow of itself so the poor who are on the front lines of climate change can't get anything to help them from the state. So they turn to the, the surplus hemi-down weaponry from the Cold War and they try and adapt to climate change by going against a different religion, going against a different ethnicity, etc. And I call this combination of these three crises the catastrophic convergence. So that's what Tropic of Chaos is about. And my current research looks at the deep origins of American developmentalism, the kind of the hidden, the history of the hidden developmentalist state within the United States. We consider ourselves to be a free market economy, government gets a very bad rap in the US, but the real economic history of US capitalism reveals that government has always played a very important role in subsidizing, directing, uh, guiding development as a consumer uh, and as a, as a at, at time to direct producer. So the actual history of American capitalism reveals that the state has always been central. And the reason I'm interested in that is in part because I think that is something we have to realize now if we're going to deal with climate change, that, that both adaptation and mitigation really demand that we get serious about what government is, what is it good for, what is its real role in a capitalist economy, so that in the immediate short term we can start taking big, bold measures to deal with cutting fossil fuel use and uh, both the physical and social adaptation to climate change that's so important.